everybody thought that starting a business was actually about taking money off VCs and VCs become your customers and you have to obsess about what VCs think. I think now that since the last couple of years, everything has gone a little bit south for people. Everybody loves thinking of what the domain name's gonna be, poodling off to hover and buying it and little MVP going, every, talking about it down the pub. Everybody loves that part of it, but it's the actual grind of a company in a business, not the product, that, it, that takes the time and can grind you down if you're not careful. I want to build a really good company. I want to be able to show and demonstrate it's possible to build a company that people love to work for and that we get away from this grim work culture where people feel like it's all about not working and getting away from work because work is, burns people out. In today's episode, my guest is Bridget Harris. Bridget is the co-founder of You Can Book Me, a calendar-based scheduling tool with over 20,000 customers and 1.5 million bookings handled every month. Before starting You Can Book Me, she worked as a special advisor for the UK government, as well as other jobs in UK politics. You can see often Bridget on big SaaS conferences like SaaS Talk, SaaS Open, where she speaks about her journey, bootstrapping, building a global team, or profit sharing. I'm personally really looking forward to this episode. And a fun fact, we are recording this again live in Bucharest, Romania, as we're heading to the TechPon Awards tonight. Welcome to the show, Bridget. Thank you very much, Jorn. Lovely to be here. Cool. We're going to dive right in to get to know you and you can book me. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of quick questions uh, so people can get a bit more context. When did you start it, You Can Book Me? The first version of You Can Book Me, the product, went out in 2011. I took over as, as you said, co-founder, but also CEO full time. I gave up my job in politics in 2012. But actually the story of myself and my co-founder Keith as technologists and entrepreneurs, that started a long time ago. So the first product that Keith first built was in 2003. So actually we've been doing this for more than 20 years. Right. And uh, you're really open about it. Like what is your current ARR right now? So we're about $5 million ARR. And is there any separation between service and product revenue, or is it purely product? I would say more than 95% self-service, product-led growth all the way. We're the poster child of product-led growth. Yeah. And you work fully uh, global, right? Like, how many global employees do you have? We are a remote company, and we're very passionate about employing people remotely as well. So we have three people in America, and then uh, most of our developers are hired in Portugal, and Spain, although we actually do have one here in Romania. And then the rest of the team is spread about Europe and in the UK. So in total, we have about 22 employees of You Can Book Me, but we have an effective headcount of more like 30 because we employ a lot of partners and um, people who work for us one, one way or another full time or contractors. All right, so yeah, we're going to dive more in, into that. And I guess, can you explain in one or two sentences, what does You Can Book Me actually do? You Can Book Me is an online scheduling tool. So you connect a booking page with your calendar so that you can show your free times in the form of slots that people can select, fill out their details, and secure a slot in your calendar to book you. Nice. And so you started the product in 2003 before politics. Is, it, is this your first startup? Yes, so that was a totally different product in 2003. But the point that I'm trying to make is that building products of which You Can Book Me is one of around 10 products we've built, is different to a company, which is what You Can Book Me is you know, in terms of employees, which is different to a business, which is how do you make money and what kind of a business are you in? We've been building products for over 20 years. The first business that we were in was You Can Book Me because it was the first that started to make money from customers. And then You Can Book Me as a company has grown up over the last sort of 12 or 13 years. Yeah. This is our only thing. We've never done anything else. Nice. So it's, I guess, a one out of 10, which actually went, went, went through it. We're yeah. on course in terms of the probability. <laughs> I love it. Have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur? No. Nice. <laughs> well, we're going to dive more into that as well. May I ask, like, how young are you? Oh, I'm 50 years old. I'm very proud of that fact. Okay. I think that by, by telling everybody or starting a sentence now that I'm 50, it makes me feel a lot more wise. I think I've definitely got wiser as, I, as I've, I've hit my, 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 the second half of my life. Yeah, no, I can definitely agree to that because uh, we had some good conversation in Morocco already. Do you have an end goal defined with You Can Book Me? Obviously, that is completely dependent on, on how you look at it. For me and Keith personally, I would say we've reached a lot of our goals. We're financially secure, we are independent, we get to control our day-to-day -day life, we get to do whatever we want to do. So if you say 
do we set out uh, 20 years ago to be, to be financially independent and in control of our own destiny? We've, we've achieved our goal. On the other hand, I care very passionately about the product and what it can do for our customers and also for the team that work on it. So for you can book me as a product, I have a huge amount of ambition for it to keep going from strength to strength, for it to help empower small businesses so that lots of people can use our tool to help them build their businesses in a way that is efficient and effective and hopefully cost effective for them. And then for our team, I think that there is, as as I'm 50, most of the people who work for us are in their 20s and 30s and 40s. So I have a lot of ambition for them because I see myself in their shoes when I was in my 20s. And I still want You Can Book Me to be the kind of company that offers opportunities for those people so that they can grow their careers inside You Can Book Me. So to that extent, no, we have not reached yet our goals for the product, the customers and the team. But for me and Keith as founders, we're very happy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that goes really well to the next question. What keeps you motivated? You probably answered this. That's right, basically right it. Yeah, exactly. I said this to my team just we went had a team retreat in Scotland a couple of weeks ago. And I said that if I was still insecure and unhappy in my 50s about what I wanted to do in my life, I would say I, I had a deeper problem than just the, the running a software company. In fact, I'm pretty content. However, I am not the same as somebody in their 20s who wants to learn, grow and develop. And all the life changes that happen, you get married, you have kids or you go traveling or you decide who it is that you want to be. These are all things that help get supported by a company like You Can Book Me. And that, I find that very motivating. Yeah. yeah, I think that something almost you can do back, I guess, towards others, which is really nice that you can see other people grow as well. Yeah, and I won't lie, it is also partly of my competitive nature, which is I want to build a really good company. I want to be able to show and demonstrate it's possible to build a company that people love to work for and that we get away from this grim work culture where people feel like it's all about not working and getting away from work because work is, burns people out. I, I'm not saying that we, have it, we, we do it perfectly all the time at all, but we work hard at it. Yeah, yeah. If we go all the way back, and we're going to now dive a bit deeper... How did you came up with the idea of You Can Book Me? So 10 uh, product, right? Yes. Uh, one, one succeeded. So how did you came up with You Can Book Me as it is, right? So You Can Book Me was born out of a classic pivot from a different tool, which was also a scheduling tool. So as I said, Keith, my co-founder and CTO, he'd built a product a long time ago in 2003 called Tickboxer, which was a, a really successful tool in the sense of t software and product, which was a survey building tool but it had no customers and no users. So we, we sunset it pretty quickly. I have to say we had two users, myself in local government and one of Keith's clients also used it, but that was it. Then about five years later, he built a tool called When Is Good, which is still going at the moment, which is a tool that finds time for a group of people to meet. And that had loads of users, thousands of people signed up, thousands of people used it, but no customers. But from When Is Good, we could see the potential of turning or Keith could see how he could integrate a booking interface like When Is Good with a Google Calendar. And that was in 2011. And that totally took off. So we ended up with loads of users, thousands of users plus customers. And so to an extent, You Can Book Me was born out of 10 years of experience of what wasn't going to work and what didn't fly out the, out the door. But the product market fit for You Can Book Me happened almost instantly. And maybe had it been our first product, we'd have taken that for granted. But the fact is, we knew this was it, yeah. that this was something that was going to fly. Yeah, and I think the good thing here is you already know exactly what they're looking for. Plus, you had a community or like users exactly. to actually tap into. As you mentioned, like product market fit almost happens instantly. Did you know from the beginning it was going to be such a success? Well, no. No, no, you never know anything. No, no, no. We knew it was going to be a success in the terms of exponential growth and commitment, lots of other things take over. So your relationship with customers takes over. So if you've got customers emailing you all the time with feature requests and wanting to give you more money and wanting you to build more, you can get this momentum that is, is externally generated that you then continue to respond to. So in a way, you haven't got time to worry or think about whether it's going to be a success or not. Because if your day is spent all day, every day talking to customers and building product for them, it stands to reason that it's going to be successful. We didn't know, I didn't think I'd be sitting here 10 years later in a hotel room in Bucharest talking about a multi-million pound software company that has made a lot of money over the years. I, I think that's probably one of the pieces of advice I would have. If you're bootstrapped, you can afford to think like this. If you're VC funded, 
they do have a very mechanical business plan that you need to work towards, which is perfectly legitimate. So they're like, we're going to give you this amount of money that you need to turn into that amount of money within a couple of years, or you need to raise more money to add to the pot one way or another. And so you need to hit these metrics for a product market fit or for growth. And that's fine because the investment is is being put in for a return. Whereas with bootstrapping, you can afford to do things a lot more slowly. You can just manage your cash and make sure you don't run out of money. So for me, success for the first seven years was not failing, was not running out of money, was staying alive, being able to pay myself, Keith and others in the company and holding on really. So that for me, success was not failing. And now it's okay to find success now. Do we want to be as big as Calendly or do we want to be bigger than Calendly or do we want to IPO at some stage? There's lots of options for you can book me as a product that we can consider now that would be inconceivable for me to have thought about at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, And then maybe one thing good to know is you even wrote a manual on how to bootstrap or the bootstrapping manual. I think this is the bootstrapping manual, which hopefully you'll put a link in the comments. Hundred percent. Yeah, no, it will be at the at the top. And actually people will know that if they follow through on that, they do get a freebie in terms of a free upgrade on you can book me. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I read it after the, the Marrakesh trip, which I, I really loved. I really enjoyed it, reading it, and uh, made a lot of notes, so that's really nice. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask, like, you advocate a lot on bootstrapping, right? You can clearly see that you're getting enthusiastic about it. Was it a conscious decision to never take any external money or at least like VC funding? No, it wasn't. We weren't ideological about it. We were pretty naive and not very well informed, but this was, of course, 12, 13 years ago. You wouldn't launch a startup now in 2024 and not know all your options or find my bootstrappers manual or talk about it with people who've raised money or other founders. The networking that's available now for startups uh, is incredible. Whereas you've got to imagine that me and Keith started You Can Book Me in 2011 or 2007 with When Is Good. That's 2007. There weren't any SASTER or SASTOC st- local meetups in London or nobody knew what we were doing. The banks thought we were crazy. Our friends and family looked on bemusedly about what we were trying to do. So we had no context about what our options were. And at various times we ran out of money and we had to borrow money. And we did. We, we had private loans. We borrowed money from the bank in the form of an overdraft. And we did do pitch days where we had angels talk to us about potentially investing in in, in us. But I just got the wrong vibes from those meetings. And the vibes were, oh, they're going to give me money, but then they're going to tell me what to do with that. And I don't want that. I want to just have control over our lives, not just obviously you can book me, but the rest of our lives I wanted control over. And so I didn't want to suddenly hand over a chunk of my, I, I didn't see it as in terms of equity in my business. I saw it in terms of how much permission somebody has to tell me what to do every day. And I didn't want that. So it was more of a personal decision in some ways than financial. We probably should have taken the money if it was if you were if you look back and you look at the history of You Can Book Me and Calendly, which is launched a couple of years after You Can Book Me and has obviously done phenomenally well as an incredible company. And we've met the founder a couple of times and he's absolutely great. We have a huge amount of respect for that as a product. But if you look at You Can Book Me that launched a few years before Calendly did, I don't wish that we were Calendly. I don't wish that we did something different because I know that over the decade of us building You Can Book Me, we built on our own terms with success defined by our own goals. And we did not consider VC funding for another few years. And then we did again. We had another meeting in with some VCs in, in London. And again, it was a sort of the way we approached it and what we talked about and, and how we described our business and how we cared about it. It just didn't... I think we just came across as a bit mad or eccentric to the VCs because we didn't sit there and say, we're going to give you a 10x exit over the next four years and this is what you're going to do. We just came across as obsessed with customers, obsessed with our product, obsessed with online scheduling, super detailed and focused. But we hadn't contextualized You Can Book Me at all as a financial opportunity for other people. It was a bit like, yeah, join the scheduling gang and then really get into new features that we want to build for our customers. Here they all are. There's thousands of them. And I think the VCs were like, oh, who are these people? We can't. We VCs couldn't deal with us. We couldn't deal with them. So it wasn't ideological. And now, as I'm as I said before, I am 50. I'm a lot wiser. I can, we've personally, me and Keith have now invested in various funds. I'm not against it at all. I just think it's a tool. Money, the money that's coming from investors is a tool. It's a relationship you have with them. I think that we, it got all got a bit mad a few years ago and everybody thought that 
starting a business was actually about taking money off VCs and VCs become your customers and you have to obsess about what VCs think. I think now that since the last couple of years, everything has gone a little bit south for people. Everybody's realising that the entrepreneurship and the founder spirit that is there, that should be held in the sovereignty of the entrepreneurship community, not the investor community. And the investors are lucky if they get to invest in our companies, not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's funny because you came out of politics and you don't want to have the politics within the company. That's why you didn't precisely. Think you, yeah. Absolutely, precisely. And I think that, frankly, and I've never said this before, actually, and I don't, I don't want this to be too overblown, but it's a lot of white men in the investor community. And I've just come out of politics, which is an endemically sexist culture. I think software and technology industry has its problems, clearly, not unsurmountable. But as a female CEO, it would have been me essentially deferring to a lot of white men. And again, there's a part of me that's over that. Yeah, I can imagine. We're going to dive into the fun for fun moment now to talk about it in hindsight. It's not been fun up till now. (laughs) (laughs) Because everybody hits like a rock button moment, right? We already mentioned friends thought you were crazy. You did the private loans. Can you tell any anything about some rock bottom moment, which is either financially, personally, and how did you came out of it? There's a long list, obviously, because we've been doing it for a long time. But I would just like to say, yes, of course, there's times where I can say that things are hard and, and there's no doubt it's tough. And especially it's painful when particularly people have taken on funding and they've just run out of money and they have to close their software company down or they have to move on or they have to accept failure. That is incredibly painful. There is no doubt about it. If you double your energy and investment into something to make it work and exist and then it's taken away from you, you get double the pain. So I I get that. On the other hand, rock bottom for me is losing my home, losing my family, losing everything. And I must say that, and actually I genuinely would advise this to anybody starting their own company, do not put your family and your home on the line. I never did. It's a personal choice in my bootstrapping manual, which I have to say is completely free. I like I'm plugging it as if it's on the Amazon top (laughs) bestselling list, but it's completely free. But I say, I list the things that I would, that were, were my red lines in terms of what I wasn't, prepared to sacrifice. So for example, I wasn't prepared to borrow more money than I know I could personally pay back in the course of an ordinary job. So like a student loan, I wasn't prepared to put our asset, which was our, we had a two bedroom flat in London that was our asset that we didn't have a mortgage on. So as a result, we could earn from rent, renting it out and that kind of thing. I was never going to mortgage my ha- my home. And I never sacrificed family time that um, we wanted to prioritise for the sake of the company. And I think that's because people do that thinking that it's all going to be great next year. I still do. I still think next year is going to be a turnaround year or everything's going to come together by September. I still have deep optimism and energy for short term deadlines. And all that happens is you it's like it's a marathon based on a series of sprints. People say it's a marathon, not a sprint, but nobody can conceptualize the marathon. So what you have to realize is every sprint you do is builds up to basically a marathon. So back to your question about rock bottom, th- those times we've hit when we were being overwhelmed with support, myself and Keith and our colleague Kate doing tickets, support tickets till two o'clock in the morning and there's still 70 in the inbox. That feels horrible because you're letting down customers and it just feels grim in the middle of the night to be answering tickets to school secretaries in America who are trying to get their help with their booking pages. And you're like, this is not going to be done. I have to go to bed and the work's not going to be done. Anything like that feeling is awful or when the service has gone down in the years gone by. I think there was times personally when me and Keith, we became profitable in 2016, 2017. We made our first £100,000 over a million. So it was basically a 10% profit margin. We hit our first million and we'd done a 10% profit on that. And that felt great. But then, of course, don't forget, we had been, that was nearly 10 years, like from when is good from 2007 through to you can book me. So that's 10 years of not knowing whether we were actually going to make money. And so there was plenty of times when Keith was, he's a developer. So he was like, oh, I could just get a job as a developer. And I remember there was this one time when he, there was this job for a software developer, like a Java developer in Luton. We live in Bedford. It was like 60,000 a year or something or 55,000 a year. And he went off on the train to go and get that job. And he came back and he didn't get the job. And it's, oh God, Keith can't even get a job in Luton. What are we going to do? Like, how are we going to, like, how are we going to move on? And at the time, 
all of our friends were getting mortgages and buying new cars and going on nice holidays. And we weren't. We weren't doing those things. And so it's a sort of, OK, how long are we going to take this for the sake of something more? And, it t- and that, take, that can sometimes take years. So I wouldn't say that's rock bottom, but I would say you're bumping along the floor for quite a long time. And you just have to be, some people would not accept that. Some people would say, no, I've got the skills to go and get a three figure salary from a big company and get share options and do it a different way. Completely fair. We decided to do it this way. And there was plenty of times when you don't know whether necessarily this was the right decision or whether you would do it again. And I have to say, You Can Book Me has been, it's it's not 100% the same, but it, it is running your own company over 10, 15 years as co-founders, as bootstrap founders, it's close to basically birthing a child it, you, you can't get away from them they can't they're completely dependent on you. your children obviously slightly separately because they're glorious and beautiful but a, a company becomes extremely dependent on you and so it's a 24-hour responsibility and I think it's that slow burn over many years that you have to watch yourself yeah yeah because as you mentioned you, you can go from thinking about next year is going to be great or if I do this it's mm. going to be great but you always have that Absolutely. feeling like even now when things yeah. are Yeah, you have to say maybe no so for example we built other products that we just had to close down because we had the enthusiasm of being able to launch them everybody loves thinking of what the domain name's going to be pootling off to hover and buying it and little MVP going every, talking about it down the pub everybody loves that part of it yeah. but it's the actual grind of a company in a business not the product that, it, that takes the time and can grind you down if you're not careful. Yeah, and I, I think you have the clear example, right? It took two, 10 years to actually get to a point where you got where money. Where made some money. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So you will have to put in the work and it's not just building an MVP from a pop conversation into uh, something. One thing I want to ask still is the support tickets, right? You did that until two in the morning, three in the morning. Like, how did you overcome those kind of moments to make them a bit more positive? It was a challenging period. Yes. Like, oh, change. I, Every time it's change. Anytime, I'm, I've said this before publicly, I'm very selfish and lazy. I don't like doing things I don't want to do. So if I'm doing tickets at two o'clock in the morning, I don't do that for very long before I change it because it's not acceptable. So most of the time, anything where you think the company cannot depend on me doing something at two in the morning, I change it. So I hire more people, bring in better systems, change the software, remodel what we're doing, change the how often we're offering support or to whom we're offering support make everything more automated, constantly change it. I don't want to or intend to put up with things that affect my life negatively. Like you mentioned, it almost being selfishness, but it's also more putting yourself in your strengths, as in if you don't want to do supporting it until 2 exactly. in the morning. Exactly, like I've got to change it, it. yeah. It's not your I'm not a self-sacrificer at no. all. No, in the end you did it, you experienced it, you don't like it, so you're going to change it for the better and you probably know exactly how to change this because you already did it before. Yeah. And then I think I would say as well, again, that's the longevity of my experience. That's not the last time support's melted down. Anything that you get set up and done in in the correct way, you can feel satisfied that you've sorted that bit of your company out and then you can go and look at something else. And then after a couple of years, it will all fall apart again. And I've seen that several times with multiple departments. You think you get it all sorted, sigh of relief. It does work for a while and then it just falls apart again. And so everything needs continuous maintenance. Are you struggling to find people and companies which have access to your ideal customer profile? At Redditors, we just launched the second side of the marketplace, which allows you to search, filter and contact B2B SaaS affiliates which have access to the audience you're looking for. We do this by leveraging first party data sources. Want to learn more? Go to getredditors.com. Yeah, and if we talk about those moments where things fall apart, like what has been or what has been some couple big company challenges you had along the way? So really, I guess, like struggling moments. We've had technical moments because we've had to maintain this technical, the technology stack to keep it up to date. And that's meant two or three huge migrations from, for example, the original application was a backend application, server side application. And we have now just completed this year, last year, the final part of the project to move the whole of the application that people would use and interact with the booking pages, the account settings, everything into the front end, into React. And that project started in 2016, where we basically did all of our account settings that went into the front end. And then a couple of years ago, uh, we started work on the booking experience. And then that went into React. And that was challenging because it's boring for people to have to either work on an old stack 
that's got problems that you then say we're not going to carry on innovating in that old stack because we're going to rewrite it and put it into the new technology or people are working on migration which is always difficult and boring to have to move millions of lines of data one way or another across to a new version or the new version isn't working as it should do because you haven't put all of the new features into it that you intended to do that were supported in the old version. So none of it is great. Again, we're a 12 year old software company as opposed to a two year old software company where everything's greenfield, everything's a new feature, it's all super exciting. And so you have to educate the team inside a company like ours, which is sometimes you've just got this big, serious, meaty, chunky thing that we, we need to do. And it would be a mistake to ignore it. So if we were still on Java backend applications, we would have died by now as a business. So you have to do it. You have to invest in it. You have to plan and project manage it. It's just not that, it's not that inspiring or motivating for people. No, we did the exact same thing. Luckily, we weren't that big at that time. So it only took us six months. But for me, I think I made a lot of mistakes where we just like this big goal. I'm not a developer, so my goal was just to get the migration done. That was my end goal. Yeah. But to get there, you need a lot of steps. Yeah. Like if you're going to do it for such a long period, you need to properly plan it, but maybe even more importantly, keep the people motivated exactly. to get to the end goal. Like, How did you do that? Yeah. I think some of, some of it is just really good project management because people can be motivated by reaching milestones. So everything needs to be properly tracked. So you reach a milestone every every Friday, let's say, then people understand and they can track their progress. I don't think you can stop doing exciting, motivating things elsewhere. So we didn't stop doing things that were for customers. It just had to happen at the same time as these large changes. I think our team in particular, we're we're small and we're remote. And so we do have this opportunity of meeting up and having a lovely social time when we meet up. We've been to Scotland, as I said, a few years, weeks ago. Last year we were in France. We've done, obviously, COVID intervening, but we've done other really nice meetups in countries like Costa Rica and Malaga and Alicante and Dominican Republic and Lisbon. And we've tried to get the team together in places where we can really enjoy the work. It comes down to the similar concepts, which is teamwork. If you make the work happy and enjoyable because the team likes each other, even if the work is difficult, they will stay motivated to get it done. You have to keep on showing results as well being able to say, you did all of this, and now look at this. This is what people are experiencing in the product. And interaction with customers and understanding how customers like your product is very motivating for everybody. Yeah, yeah, and keeping them updated on what's going on probably helps as well Mm -hmm. and why you do things. Cool, if we go back to like the fun part, like you've been growing fast, right? 1.5 million bookings per month. I handle every month 20,000 customers. What has been like your go-to market? Like what have you been doing really well to get to the point where you are right now. It's not unfortunately a great, a very easily transferable insight into You Can Book Me, which is its viral growth loop. So those bookings deliver new accounts for us every month. So even sitting still on any other activity, we would get account growth. However, it's not it it, right now, particularly in the world of SaaS, SaaS, this plateau that we're in, it's really tough because competition is tough and brand recognition and understanding what the product can do, all of that is super tough. So again, I would say part of our go-to-market strategy is to not fail in the market that we've been given. So in viral growth, we're given a market of people who want to use the scheduling experience, the scheduling tool. So we need to make sure that our booking tool is as, as, as good as it can be. The experience is great. We're rolling out lots of changes to the tool at the moment. And we need to keep on investing in our product because product-led growth is the thing that m- people most know is about. They know about You Can Book Me because they've heard of You Can Book Me because they've booked using You Can Book Me, or they know it works better for them because of our integrations or the way that we handle something in very particular, sometimes very specific things that we do that Calendly doesn't do, for example, or HubSpot doesn't do. So they go, well, we use you for that. So we have lots of teams and so- small businesses who use You Can Book Me because they love it for, the w- for what it does for them. And then we rely on their word of mouth to tell other people and we rely on the fact that the people who are booking onto their tool, their booking pages will go, oh, I really like this experience. Who's giving them this experience? This feels different. We will create an account and have a look. So we that's essentially the word of mouth viral growth loop that we've relied on. And then I do believe that, as I said, over the investment over the last 10 years, we have continued to invest in the tool. We've continued to invest. So we haven't broken, we haven't fallen apart. We don't look aged 
our UI is beautiful. There's a lot of stuff we've just continued to invest in. And that's because instinctively we're a product-led growth company. Yeah, and I think that there's one important thing, right? If you want to have that viral loop, which you guys have going right now, you need to have a good product. Because if people yes. have a bad experience with booking uh, a call or booking uh, scheduling something, then they would probably not use the product. So in the end, the product is the, the basis, and then from there you build on top of that, of course. Absolutely. It's always fun and always difficult, but are there any certain decisions or any certain things you've done, as in, if I haven't done X, Y, or Z, then I wouldn't have been here today within the, the go-to market or within the strategy of growing You Can Book Me. Yeah, you could go back on the, all the hypotheticals of what we did do and say, take those away, would it have happened? So for example, Keith, as the CTO co-founder, he was doing all of the software development 15 years ago, but he wasn't in a position to run a business and a company. The decision that I took in 2012 to, in effect, forego my career that I had already established in politics in Westminster in the UK to run a software company. I mean, to answer your question earlier about did I ever want to be an entrepreneur? No, it was not. I did not sit there and say, I want to run a business one day. It was not in any way one of my life goals at all. But on the other hand, as I said, being married to Keith and having this experience of building web products, web development, which was giving us and yielding this opportunity for income of clearly I had this op option to run You Can Book Me and see how we could develop that into the best opportunity we could. And we worked very hard together and separately in terms of our jobs. So Keith doing technology and me doing the business and company sort of finance and operations that between the two of us, we managed it. Now, I think that you could say plenty of scheduling tools have come and gone and plenty of them have. Doodle years ago had a scheduling tool close to You Can Book Me that they closed down. I think they've got something spooled back up again. But we saw Google Appointments service again. Google Appointments was launched in 2012. They Then they closed it down to people. We had oh, we're, uh, there were probably all these tools people won't have heard of, but things like Tungle was a competitor at one point. And they were acquired by BlackBerry and then they, cl they got closed down. So over the years, we saw lots of booking tools like ours not making it one way or another. And I think that's probably because small businesses and people who rely on You Can Book Me or rely on bookings for their business, they've got high expectations and, and not a lot of cash to spread around. So in any kind of economic environment where you're trying to serve a small business environment, it's hard, it's really hard work. So there probably wasn't any guarantee that it would have happened had me and Keith not been fully committed together as co-founders to make it work. So I think it did happen because of blood, sweat and tears. It didn't happen because of some magic in the market that we were gifted. It happened because we didn't give up. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really critical decision. Like you quit your job from politics, you committed to go all in 10 years to actually get your profit right. And mm -hmm. you fully o obsessed over product and customers, which I think is the most important thing you can do. Exactly. Nice. We talked about product-led growth, viral loops. The question I want to ask now, do you use any processes or frameworks to, to grow You Can Book Me? Uh, you also are a big advocate on uh, profit sharing, so mm -hmm. motivating the team. Are there mm -hmm. any things you maybe can explain here or maybe other things you use internally to grow? Internally, just organizationally, if, it, if this is helping answer your question, we have adopted over the last year Traction, which is yeah. the entrepreneur's operating system. And that is more designed to keep a small remote team on track with a lot of deadlines and ambition that we have every quarter to deliver what we set out to deliver. And I adopted that last year and it's worked really well. And that has helped filter down to project planning and uh, project management so that we're able to fully define the priorities and plan for them over and above anything else that we thought about wanting to do. Otherwise, what tends to happen is everybody has their own agendas about what they think is important and everybody goes off and starts doing random things. And it was about saying we have to be super clear on what the priorities are. Following on from that, we've also done a huge amount of work in the last year on our ICP, who's most successful using You Can Book Me. And because there's a horizontal tool We've ended up with lots and lots of verticals. Yeah. You could say we have dentists that use You Can Book Me. We have huge tech companies that use You Can Book Me. We have parent-teacher conferences that use You Can Book Me in education. So how on earth do you form a marketing strategy around everybody? Because if you're everything to everybody, then you're nothing to nobody. I don't know if that double negative works, but we have been focused on a much better strategy around who gets the most benefit out of using You Can Book Me, which in turn 
informs our product priorities, which in turn informs our planning. To an extent, I've spent the last year internally focused on getting the ship super tight in what we build, who we build for, why we're building it, and when we're going to build it. And that has yielded some great results in terms of things that we've rolled out today. We've just rolled out our, I will do a pitch now, you're in a, a premier HubSpot integration. It's literally the best on the market. If you're not using HubSpot schedulers or you don't like it, but you do use HubSpot, you should be integrating with You Can Book Me because everything from bookings from You Can Book Me goes into HubSpot beautifully. That kind of thing, which we set out and understood that we needed to prioritise and build. And I think that that's going to help us grow. That is obviously there to help us grow. Something else we're doing is changing our pricing because our pricing was essentially stopped being fit for purpose a few years ago and we didn't have the capacity to really think about it at the time. But now we're rolling out new pricing in the summer and that's designed to make it more cost effective for smaller paying customers. So we're basically too expensive for if you're like a, a digital entrepreneur or a coach or a creator or somebody on the internet um, with a business if you use You Can Book Me, we're just a bit more expensive than we should be. So we're rolling out pricing that fits people and their businesses so that they've got a scheduling tool that works for them, but also doesn't cost them as much. So being able to be a bit more price sensitive was something that we focused on to be, to help us grow. Another big one was we put into the product our premier, I think you're probably going to ask questions about this, and this is my answer again, which is our overlay availability feature which is if you had a You Can Book Me account, Mm -hmm. yeah, and you went to bridget.youcanbook.me, you would be able to overlay either your You Can Book Me account or indeed calendar account or indeed your Calendly account, which I think you use Calendly, and you could overlay your times onto my You Can Book Me. And we do that because we want to make it really easy for bookers on any scheduling tool themselves to be able to book somebody on You Can Book Me so that you're offering a link which isn't just a one-way link, it's two ways. So we did that and that took, to build that, we had to do a lot of the technical debt reorganization I was talking about. But what we're trying to build is a kind of advocacy for bookers so that when people are using a scheduling tool, it's not just here are my times, but instead it's you can use this as a tool for you to tell me when you're free. And again, that's all rooted inside growth because that's about the viral loop. That's about bookers being able to see the value of you can book me when they book. Um, on a You Can Book Me page, and then they can hopefully go off and create their own You Can Book Me page. Even if they were using Calendly, they can see that it's compatible with Calendly. We literally integrate with a competitor. But again, to get that done, that we needed our internal systems and our focus needed to move away from something else. So we had to essentially change and pivot from what was other people's product priorities and what they wanted to build to really focus on these things. And I think that was the hardest thing we did last year and it's yielded results where I'm really happy. Yeah, yeah, because you focused on product experience, like how are people experiencing the product, you focused on that, and not like building the a better set of horses as a Right, board, exactly. Right? Yeah, so we had, yeah, this is it. We had a lot, when I mean, we have a lot of people with very large teams that use You Can Book Me, and there's a lot of things that are a bit niggly and they don't really like. And so we essentially compensate for that with customer success. So we have a great customer success team and they do an awful lot to help support our clients, but it's not ideal. And so our ambition will continue to be, let's make sure that there is grievances, if you like, inside the larger team management use of You Can Book Me that we can fix and an overall upgrade. However, it's nothing compared to, let's make it cheaper for coaches. Let's make it cheaper for digital marketers. Let's make it, let's just do the things at that end that is really going to transform and grow the awareness of You Can Book Me as a tool for small businesses. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing you mentioned as well, as in you kept focusing on your ICP and you mentioned who gets the most benefit, yes. which I think is interesting because you didn't say who pays us the most. You actually say who gets the most benefit. Yes. So you really looked at who's using the tool to the... Yeah, and I can elaborate on that. So these are people who've used You Can Book Me for years. We've got people who've used You Can Book Me for over 10 years. These are people who are coaches who've used You Can Book Me consistently over the last six, seven years. They've got thousands of bookings. They've never churned. They've never complained. They, the, the product's always been perfect for them. It's always done exactly what they wanted to do. And they've seen all of the changes that we've put in over the years, and they've really liked them. We've turned around and we've almost gone back to our roots to say, 
look, we can't be all things to everybody. We can't go out there and try to take on the enterprise customer engagement market that it seems to be Calendly is doing with Salesforce and HubSpot at that kind of massive level of CRM world, where because scheduling, of course, you're in people's calendars. You're very much inside a, a CRM type stack. But we can't, we can't eat, we can't drink the ocean. So we just looked at, for us, where bookings are somebody's business, where we really matter to somebody because if they don't get bookings, they don't earn. They don't, their job is essentially being fueled through the bookings that they take. We really matter to them. And inside the company, we had a theme in our Scotland week, which is making friends with our customers, that kind of connection with our customers where we matter to them, they need to matter to us. And then therefore we can help understand internally what that emotional react what that emotional relationship is like so people can feel like you're really helping out a friend when you're building a feature that kind of thing yeah yeah and it goes really well with in the other thing you said pricing that fits people exactly. so you're now also making the pricing. you were one of the first people to tell me that we were too expensive and it's just it's bugged me ever since <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> we're building specifically for you Yarn. nice so we are going to round up you gave so much advice already, but if we're going to break it down into revenue stages, what kind of advice would you give someone who's just starting out and growing to 10K monthly recurring revenue? Yes, I thought about this. I just think there's only one thing, which is don't run out of money. I just think it's cash management, honestly. Good, solid financial tools, tooling, solid, a solid financial set of banking and reports, and you know what your cash flow is, you know how much everything is, and try to avoid spending money on anything that you don't have an immediate reaction back to what you can do with that. So if you're spending that money on developers to build the tool, great, but as, as long as what they're doing is building something that you know you can immediately sell back to customers. So at this stage, there's really no other priority. Don't run out of money. Cash is king. Yeah, and one other thing you mentioned a lot, do you already recommend obsessing over customers in this stage? Oh yeah, yes, that, I'm taking that as a given. So the thing is that People might think, oh, I've got to, I don't know, spend money on going around and advocating or marketing or or lots of merchandise. Or like at the time when we started, we had, do you remember the Google Chromebooks? They were 200 quid. You know, we just, we didn't sit there and go, yeah, let's, everybody's getting MacBook Pros. Like we didn't, you can get caught up in startup world where it's all about yoga in the morning and, and free fruit in the afternoon. And none of that is related to customer value. So it's about what can I spend money on which is going to give additional value or a feature to a customer and you can and you keep that feedback loop from customer to cash to value really tight. You don't run out of money because you only spend money on things that matter to customers. Yeah, and in the end you're probably building a team which cares about customers as well. Exactly. They don't care about any Yeah, so I was telling my team this a few weeks ago. In the early days, Keith, as the, as the developer of You Can Book Me, he would spend the morning on taking customer emails, finding out what they wanted. He would interview them. He would talk to them. And in the afternoon, he would do the feature. He'd roll it out. And then the next morning, he'd email them back to say the feature was rolled out. It was like magic. They thought he was magic. There was a lot of early lean, agile philosophy there that we didn't know that's what he was doing, but it was just, it, it was his instinct to do it. But we weren't making any money at this point. The money start, especially with You Can Book Me, we're not selling, we're selling 20 quid a month type application here. We're, it took us a long time to build up any kind of income from You Can Book Me that was any of us could live off. At the time when I, just to give you an illustration, at the time that I gave up my full-time job, we were bringing in two and a half thousand pounds a month. That's nothing. It's nothing. So that's why we're very cash conscious. And it's probably now something I probably need to loosen up a bit more about because when you're that cash conscious at the beginning, you don't spend money on anything. You're also probably not investing in longer term things that probably would benefit. But don't run out of money. Yeah, that's a really good advice. And I guess if we go past 10k MOR and you're on your own journey right now, right? 5 million AR. Yeah. What kind of advice would you give maybe yourself or others who are past 10k MOR, grown to 10 million AR? Yeah. I know it's a big step, but... Yeah, no, I no, and I still have to learn these lessons myself because we're struggling to get to 10 million. It's not easy for us. It's not like some flick a switch and you do it. I'm continually struggling and figuring out what it is that I need to do. I actually think it comes down to one thing and one thing alone, which is people. I think but you can't even get to 5 million, or you're very lucky if you do without a team of people. And you certainly need a very strong team of people to get to 10 million. And people have different ideas about what they want to do. I would, the books that I've read recently, like Traction, but also Radical Candor, I found very useful. 
But I think that having a deep investment in understanding how you're going to work with people, what your company culture is going to be like, what your organizational values are going to be like, how are you going to manage a team and how are you going to manage people? So, for example, as CEO, I have obviously my direct reports, but I don't spend a lot of time in meetings where I'm helping deliver the work. So I have very strong people who work for me who are delivering the work. And I think that for you to get from five to ten, this is what I myself have learned and been reading about and listening to podcasts, is you know, the leader, the leaders, they have to have some time spent looking and thinking about the bigger picture strategically. And if I don't have time to do that because I'm spending, you know, proverbially carrying on doing the support tickets, I would never be able to do it. So it's a dual thing. Your company needs to be resilient, strong enough with very strong people to run the company for you so that you have got that time to to do the strategic stuff. But also you emotionally you're never going to get there if you're still absolutely in the weeds of the business and that relies on people and people are hard they're they're amazing and also the hardest part of any company so you have to be very good at dealing with people and understanding people yeah and probably hiring the right people because i think yes. the the thing i took away from jamie in, in morocco was like if you hire somebody who's much better than you and they're going to do it much yes. better than yourself then you it's easy to let go yes yes that, that's very true But that's also quite dangerous because particularly in marketing, I have to say, I've had my fingers burnt a number of times. I've believed that philosophy. I've believed that somebody's better at than, than me. I've given them loads of money and then they've gone off and they've burnt it anyway. So you could, there's no department that we haven't been burnt by the belief that somehow, oh, you must know what you're doing. There's no savior inside HR. At the end of the day, you're still responsible for what you're trying to achieve. And it's very hard to draw a line with somebody to say, I actually don't think that you're right here and I need to do this a different way, or indeed how you let go and trust people. It takes time and you need to get very good at understanding your own motivations and your own boundaries and how you trust people as well as other people. It doesn't happen by magic. Nice. I think it's a really good closing statement. Let's, I will try to summarize a little bit. We talked a lot about bootstrapping, right? It's a marathon, so it's definitely not a sprint, but don't sacrifice things now because your things are going to be great next year. So don't put your family and house on the line. Don't borrow more money than you can pay back. If you're in my situation, because I was in my late 30s, if in your 20s, you can do what you like. Yeah, in the end, there's not much you can put on the line probably exactly. at that point anyway. And I guess if people are buying houses right now, like you will make sure that you are on a marathon. So yes. it will take time. When being fully remote, like you did, came together quite uh, often times in really exotic locations as well, which is nice. Want to get a viral loop going, all word of mouth, good product and customer experience is key. People check out Traction, uh, the EOS. It helps with planning and reaching goals. Keep focusing on your ICP. So who gets the most benefit rather than who pays the most? And then in the end, people are important because everything is related to it. Cool. Thank you for coming on. What is the best way for people to reach out to you if they want to get in contact with you? LinkedIn. I'm just the Bridget Harris. I'm just, you, I'm findable on LinkedIn, I think. I am on Twitter. I'm not like the world's biggest social media influencer, I have to say, but I I am on Twitter and I think I'm, I'm on Instagram and TikTok, but I think LinkedIn is my favorite platform. Or indeed, I just email me. I'm Bridget at youcanbook.me. Perfect. We're going to add your LinkedIn profile. We're going to add the bootstrapping manual. We're going to add the traction book. So we're going to make sure that you find all the relevant materials. We're going to add a poll to the Spotify app. So make sure to respond to that because I'm always really curious to hear what people think about the episodes. Thank you for coming on, Bridget. Thank you very much. Lovely to be Cheers. on your show. Thank you for watching this show of the Grow Your B2B SaaS podcast. You made it till the end. So I think we can assume you like this content. If you did, uh, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you like this content, feel free to reach out if you want to sponsor the show. If you have a specific guest in mind, if you have a specific topic you want us to cover, reach out to me on LinkedIn. More than happy to take a look at it. If you want to know more about Redditus, uh, feel free to reach out as well. But for now, have a great day and good luck growing your B2B SaaS.